Okay, so the preference is that everybody come forward if you're willing to do so. And um, while I will, the first half is will be primarily didactic, my preference is that this be interactive as well. So I scared you this morning about all the challenges with toxic load and how it contributes so substantially to our patients' ill health. So now this is about what to do about it. <clears throat> so we talked about a bit of it this morning. Now let's get into some more depth. <clears throat> so mercury. So clearly mercury avoidance is just critical. As I mentioned, that uh, chelation study that was done and published in the Journal of American Dental Association, <clears throat> chelation therapy is very effective at getting mercury out of the blood. Um, so the chelation, all the mercury is gone uh, after the chelation, but within 24 hours, it comes right back to where it was. So clearly you've got to get the sources out. So avoidance, uh, choose lower mercury fish and get the amalgams removed by an ecological dentist. Then we want to facilitate the body's own mechanism for getting rid of mercury. So it turns out we're actually pretty good at this if we support the body's own processes. Now this is a, a data point from one of my uh, science staff. <clears throat> I have not independently verified this, but he said he found research showing that 1% of the body load of mercury is excreted into the gut every day. The problem is 99% of what's excreted is reabsorbed because there's no fiber in the gut. So it's hard to overemphasize the importance of fiber in the gut. <clears throat> As Michael Ash said this morning, of course, fiber does many beneficial, beneficial things for the body. The second thing we can do then is also then to directly remove the mercury. So nutritional supplement, N-acetylcysteine or NAC for short, uh, turns out is very good at binding to methylmercury and increasing its excretion in the urine. I'll show you some research on that in a moment. So that dose is 500 milligrams twice a day. And then for DMSA, um, that's the drug I, of choice that I have. And my pr preferred program with that is 250 milligrams every third night. Okay, so that protocol works. I've used it in a lot of people, uh, both in corporate wellness programs where I got to test people but before and afterwards, and now I've been using it anecdotally, or I've been using it with individual patients. You might say anecdotally, I'll tell you what the results are there. So when we're looking at DMSA, that's 2,3-dimercaptosuccinic acid. Uh, this is a uh, chemical that was <clears throat> um, developed in the uh, 50s as an alternative to the more toxic uh, chelation agents that are being used for lead. So although DMSA preferentially binds to lead, it binds almost as well to mercury. So the nice thing about DMSA is it gets out mercury and it gets out lead. About 10 to 20 percent of the oral dose is absorbed, so you might wonder why is it so effective. Well, one reason it's so effective is that anything the body's trying to get rid of in the gut, now there's some DMSA there to bind to it to get it out. Uh, so it chelates all forms of uh, mercury. It also chelates uh, lead. Uh, about half of the absorbed DMSA is excreted through the bile. About half is excreted through the urine. The, um, basically, f the 250 milligrams of DMSA will bind about 7.5 micrograms. So you bind, I'm sorry, you bind 7.5 micrograms of mercury for every gram of DMSA you prescribe to your patient. So obviously it's gonna take time. So clear warning, this protocol I'm showing you takes time, but it works and it's very rare to get an adverse effect with the, with the patient. The half-life in the body is about two to three hours. And also something with, with DMSA which is interesting, and that is it increases the production of glutathione. Now whether that's the body saying DMSA is a toxin it's reacting to, or whether it's doing something to promote uh, glutathione production, I don't know, but glutathione levels actually go up. Uh, so DMSA, um, here's some examples, research done. This was done with, this particular done was, done, this was done with lead, and this was done with mercury. And what's showing that when you give these agents, uh, after you give it, uh, it does decrease the amount of mercury in the blood, and then goes back up to normal. So the bottom line is that it doesn't, doesn't take a lot out, but it takes it out. So the point is, we're constantly taking it out of the body. You can improve the efficacy of the DMSA with alpha lipoic acid, endocytocysteine, probiotics, and fiber, as you would expect. Um, now, when researchers are using DMSA, they're using pharmacological dosages. So typically, they're using 30 milligrams per kilogram per day. The typical protocol is seven days on, seven days off. I'm not recommending that. And the reason I'm not recommending that is because at that dosage, you will get toxicity. As a matter of fact, about 15% of the people at that dose will get a toxic reaction, including elevation of liver enzymes. So it's not a great, great protocol. So when we're doing a corporal wellness program, 
program, the protocol we used was we first gave people 50 milligram uh, trial dose and we watched them for an hour to see if they reacted to it. Now, the reason we're doing that so carefully is because we were concerned that people who are sulfur sensitive might react to it. And the reality is that we simply did not see that. Now, having said that, I've since had some people start to react who are sulfur sensitive. I'll give you a protocol for that in a moment. So the protocol we actually used for the data I'm going to show you was three days on, 11 days off. I don't think that was the optimal program protocol, but I got talked out of it. So we had you know, it's a group of doctors, and I said, here's what I wanted to do because I did the research. They said, no, we want to do it differently, and they outvoted me. Because that's fine. Um, my preference at this point, though, is 250 milligrams every third day rather than 250 milligrams three days in a row and then 11 days off. Okay, <clears throat> NAC. So NAC is great. So here's a nice study looking at uh, methylmercury and giving NAC. It's an animal study, but it's real clear that uh, we got the, um, the mercury out of the animals. And it also was done in uh, pregnant animals uh, with DMSA and with NAC, and it did get mercury out of the fetus. Now you're going to ask me, is that okay to do with humans? And you, as you know, the answer to that is pregnant women, you can't mess around, so um, I can't recommend it for pregnant women. But I'll tell you, for pregnant animals, it gets the mercury out of the fetus. Okay, um, so the NAC we're using is at modest, do modest dosages. As you know, um, IV NAC is the protocol of choice for acetaminophen uh, poisoning. Again, we're not using that high dosage because when using high dose IV NAC, then you start getting toxic effects as well there. When using oral doses of NAC, um, the typical dose is 500 milligrams one to two times per day. It's used in people with cystic fibrosis. And so I looked at one study of 4,000 patients followed, I think it was for two years, no, adverse, no serious adverse events uh, were, were mentioned. So it looks really safe. Now having said that, <clears throat> you may have a patient who's so sensitive to sulfur compounds that when you're giving them DMSA plus the NAC, you may overload them with sulfur. So in that case, uh, you're going to have to be more careful with your dosing. Uh, you can detect which ones are most likely to react by doing the urinary sulfite to sulfate uh, ratio. So in general, people are good at handling sulfur. Good, I'll ask your questions. Good, I'll, uh, questions are great. Let me finish this and I'll ask your, ask, ask your questions. So you can uh, get uh, a handle on who's most likely sulfur sensitive by those who have a high sulfite to sulfate ratio in the urine because they have trouble converting sulfites to sulfates. Those are also typically in your uh, asthmatic patients are the ones who have trouble converting sulfites to sulfates, and they're the ones where you get the sulfites down and give them molybdenum. You can also help your patients with, with asthma. So the molybdenum dosage here is pretty conservative, 300 micrograms per, per day, and manganese 20 milligrams per day. You can use more than that. And what I would recommend if a patient starts reacting, then stop the DMSA, stop the NAC, Dose, load them up with the uh, molybdenum and, and manganese, and then try again and see what kind of doses they can handle. Question? <coughs> Answered? Okay, great. Okay, onward. Fiber. Big, big factor, big key with fiber is it decreases intrahepatic recirculation. So that's just the way, where, way it works. Now, in this study we did in Canada, <coughs> the fiber we use is called PGX. It's proprietary fiber uh, made by natural factors in Canada. Now, I, I need to say conflict of interest. I consult for natural factors for the professional brand called Bioclinic Naturals. Now, having said that, um, the reason I use PGX is because I got a really good deal on it. And uh, so, we <laughs> so we use two, two and a quarter grams uh, three times a day with these patients. It's also a very good blood sugar stabilizer. It also helps lose weight. And as you might expect with this uh, oil, these oil field workers, there's a lot of obesity with them. So I thought I'd do a two for one, get out the toxins and also help them with blood sugar stabilization. <clears throat> Okay, so lead uh, detoxification. There are a bunch of um, protocols that are used. Oh, let me go back to mercury for a second. Um, so when we first started doing mercury, we were doing IV DMPS because that was the protocol that was being used by the chelation doctors. Now, I hope I'm not going to antag antagonize anybody, but we got so many adverse effects uh, in people using the IV DMPS that we stopped doing it and I was tasked with finding an alternative. I was one of those people. So we had a certain portion of our group, what the percentage is, I can't say, probably between five and 10% who got, quote, brain fog from, having, from doing the uh, IV DMPS. I was one of those people. So typically, I go up once a month to corporate wellness program in Canada. <clears throat> I would go and get my chelation therapy for my mercury first and then go to a meeting afterwards 
and it made me stop doing the IV chelation therapy because my brain wasn't working well enough for the meetings they're spending so much money on flying me to Canada to do. So p some people will get uh, brain fog. So we sp basically stopped doing it. Okay, now for, um, for lead, pardon? I, I, if I have time, I will. Okay, so uh, now for lead chelation, there are a bunch of protocols that have been used. Interestingly enough, oral DMSA is as effective as IV EDTA. Now here's why. Now IV EDTA is indeed very effective at getting lead out of the body, but you do it once a month. Now if you do the DMSA every third night, you actually end up taking out as much lead as you do with one IV chelation therapy. And the nice thing about this is you don't get adverse effects. Also, some people have recommended uh, using oral EDTA, and I dismiss that as not, not making any sense. <clears throat> and then I also did a PubMed search for uh, EDTA, oral EDTA and lead, and there's nothing in PubMed. Well, then good old Jerry, um, what's your last name? No, I'm blank on his name, sorry. Anyway, one of the uh, chelation promoters uh, said to me, well, you have to look at the research in the 50s. And back in the 50s, a bunch of research was done with oral EDTA, looking at lead, and actually very clearly, it was actually quite effective. Again, not as good, pardon, Gary Gordon. Sorry, 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 Gary. Yeah, Gary Gordon. Anyway, so Gary, actually, he's, he's good. He actually sent me a dozen papers. So I actually got to read them too. And it showed that the oral EDTA is an effective way of getting rid of lead. Now, it won't get rid of any of your other uh, toxic elements, but we'll, we'll get rid of lead. Um, I just made it simple, I just used DMSA. It works great for both lead and mercury. Uh, cadmium detoxification, you have to be extremely, extremely careful because anything that loosens up cadmium in the tissues is going to dump it into the kidneys. And again, you heard my story earlier today. Interestingly enough, there's some research now in animals using oral DMSA and it actually decreases cadmium levels in the kidneys and also in animals whose kidneys have been damaged with cadmium, they got improved a glomerular filtra filtration rate in those animals. So if you have something you're stuck with on cadmium, it looks like small doses of DMSA are, are likely to be okay. Again, we don't have um, human research on that at this point. Turns out the best way to get rid of cadmium is by sweating it out. <clears throat> now, how many of you have listened to a Stephen Genuis lecture? Have you heard Stephen Genuis? So Stephen is an MD in uh, Edmonton, Alberta, and he spends half his time doing research and half his time seeing toxic patients. <clears throat> Fascinating guy. I met him uh, in person for the first time um, about a year ago. I was in Edmonton and we sat down and had lunch together and literally I looked up and it was two and a half hours later. I mean, it was such an engaging conversation. So what he found is when you sweat people, you get increased excretion of cadmium in the, in the sweat. And you get other things as well. So if you are gonna be using sweat therapy to get rid of cadmium, remember it does result in loss of trace minerals. But anyway, that, that does work. So arsenic, the primary method by which the body gets rid of arsenic is through methylation. And as you may know, the organic arsenic is not as toxic as the um, uh, elemental, uh, elemental arsenic. <clears throat> I don't have enough experience to give you a clear protocol on this because I simply have, was not aware enough of arsenic when I was doing my large study, so I, I simply don't have a good handle on it. I hope to get better at that at some point. Okay, so glutathione. I want to talk, spend some time with glutathione. So any questions before I go further? Uh, so some people have concern about zinc loss and copper loss when using DMSA. Theoretically, true. Practically, it doesn't seem to make much difference, okay? But nonetheless, I give people trace minerals when I'm giving them the DMSA. But I try to give them the trace minerals at a separate time from when I'm giving them DMSA. Yes? <coughs> I, I need the microphone. How do you feel about the suppository um, DMSA? Yes, so um, we actually are doing that uh, in our Calgary program. We're doing the suppository DMSA and we are getting beneficial results with it. Okay, so there's also a topical use of DMPS. Uh, I have been, it's been reported to me that that has been effective with less adverse effects. Because you give people oral DMS, DMS, um, DMPS, you get a bunch of side effects. So topical apparently has not been as bad, but I haven't had direct experience with it. So I'm just sticking with what I'm doing now because it's been working so well. Okay, glutathione. Now I'm gonna spend some uh, real time on glutathione because it's incredibly important uh, for all this toxicity. 
So if you look at uh, glutathione, uh, protects the mitochondria from oxidative stress, takes mercury out of the brain, it protects cells from oxidative stress, uh, it helps get pops out of the body. It is just remarkable how effective it is. And basically, the more glutathione people have in general, the healthier that they age. So as you know, glutathione is uh, effective in the body when it's in its reduced phase form, with this is a reduced form, and when it's oxidized, you basically have two glutathione bound together at the sulfur bridge, and that's what oxidized glutathione looks like. It's quite surprising. Our body has very high levels of glutathione in the blood at 5 millimolar. And healthy cells have a 100 to 1 ratio of reduced glutathione to oxidized glutathione. And one of the frustrations we have uh, in terms of laboratory measurements of glutathione is it only tells us total glutathione because the reduced glutathione is so fragile that by the time the samples get to the labs, it's uh, already been oxidized. It turns out that the way the mitochondria determine when they have to induce apoptosis in the cells is when the ratio of reduced glutathione to oxidized glutathione gets low. In general, once it get to, gets to about 10 to 1 reduced to oxidized, it's a signal to the cell to do apoptosis because most likely there's DNA damage at that point and we're going into cancer. And when it gets to 1 to 1, the cells always kill themselves. So it turns out that um, glutathione is very important. So look at this. This is a list of the molecules that are in our blood and look right where we have right here. We have cholesterol, we have glucose, we have potassium, and that's right where we have glutathione. So clearly, our bodies consider glutathione incredibly important to our health and works really hard to produce glutathione if the needed nutrients are available to produce the glutathione as needed because we use it up. So how do we get glutathione in the body? <clears throat> it's made available by, based by three ways. Uh, one is by de novo synthesis from cysteine, which we'll get to in a second. And the second is by recycling the glutathione. And we recycle the glutathione in two ways, uh, which I'll show you in this nice diagram here. So here we have uh, de novo synthesis of glutathione from cysteine. So this enzyme is very active, and the rate limiting step in the production of glutathione is the availability of cysteine. So that's one reason why when we give people n cysteine or give them whey powder, which is high in cysteine, you increase the production of glutathione regardless of what's going on, going on in the body. Now, this is interesting. Look at where does this all come from? Uh, it comes from homocysteine. So while we think about homocysteine as being this evil molecule in the body because high levels are associated with all kinds of degenerative disease, there's also consideration of cysteine being an important molecule in the body, and it looks like it does two things that are important. Matter of fact, I wrote an editorial on this for IMCJ. One is it acts as a storage source for cysteine in the body when needed, and second, it transports methyl groups. So elevated homocysteine is not about homocysteine being elevated. It's about the abnormal physiology that results in the homocysteine being elevated. I want to make sure you understand the difference. Anyway, so anyway, here's de novo synthesis. So the other way uh, we do this is by uh, we have an enzyme called glutathione reductase, which converts the oxidized glutathione to the reduced glutathione. So that's a, a process that recycles. And then here we have GGT. Remember, I mentioned GGT earlier today. And what GGT does is that when glutathione is bound to a toxin, it goes through, and once the body's gotten the toxin out, it kind of goes back and grabs onto the, uh, the, the, the glutathione that's in the toxin, breaks the glutathione down to cysteine, and dumps the cysteine back over here. So basically, as we need more glutathione, the body upregulates up up this enzyme to get more cysteine, which then goes into production of, of glutathione. Okay, so three ways we get glutathione. We promoted ourselves with NAC, and our body responds with two toxic load by upregulating uh, GGT. Okay, so when we look at the depletion of, again, reduced glutathione, you get all these huge disease correlations. So again, the GGT, uh, the, the glutathione uh, decrease is typically, again, due to oxidative stress and toxin exposure. So look at this, neurodegen neurodegenerative diseases, pulmonary diseases, COPD, asthma, immune disorders, cardiovascular disease, liver disease, cystic fibrosis, all the chronic age-related disease. As a matter of fact, the aging process itself is all associated with low levels of reduced glutathione. So I don't know of many molecules that have this powerful uh, correlation uh, with health in the body. So now you want to say, well, great, let's get our glutathione up. So you might say, well, under what conditions does our body upregulate GGT uh, in order to to have the need to produce more glutathione. So as you might expect, anything which is a toxin 
excessive alcohol, acetaminophen, meat intake, fried food, smoking, elevated blood sugar, obesity, anticonvulsants, uh, or contraceptive agents. You know, many of the drugs upregulate GTT because the body's having to detoxify these things. And as you would expect, um, nutrients which act as antioxidants in the body or help decrease toxins in the body decrease GTT. So uh, vitamin E, C, vitamin E, look at fiber. Fiber decreases it because, again, fiber is helping get rid of the toxins, fruits and vegetables, beans and lentils, again, high fiber source, whole grains, nut intake, physical activity, and look at this. Yay for coffee. <laughs> okay. um, caffeine has a lot of benefits in the body, but notice I said coffee, not caffeine, because coffee, as you know, has a bunch of good things in it besides just caffeine. So. Now, if we want to work on increasing glutathione, what are our strategies? Uh, number one, de decrease depletion. Number two, directly administer glutathione. Number three, increases production. And number four are lifestyle factors we can engage in to help um, increase glutathione levels in the body. So decrease depletion. Basically, almost any antioxidant will decrease depletion of glutathione. And it turns out that one of the reasons alpha lipoic acid is effective at raising glutathione levels is not because it increases production, but rather acts as an intramitochondrial, intracellular antioxidant, so it protects the, the uh, glutathione from being, from being oxidized. It turns out that um, vitamin D, when you have higher levels of vitamin D in the brain, you have higher levels of glutathione in the brain because vitamin D is acting as an antioxidant in the brain, and melatonin also results in increased amounts of glutathione in the brain. Now here's a study that's looking at uh, alpha lipoic acid, and uh, what you see is significant increased levels of glutathione, but again, not because of production, but because of antioxidant effects. Direct administration, several ways of doing this. IV glutathione, nebulized glutathione, oral glutathione, oral liposomal glutathione, topical glutathione and, glutathione, and intranasal glutathione. Okay, so IV, very short half-life in the blood, and I'm actually not a supporter of IV glutathione, and I know that may antagonize some people in the room. And the reason I'm not is because of research done in animals, if an animals have high levels of mercury in the blood and you give them IV glutathione, it takes the mercury from the blood and puts it into the brain. So what our body tries to do is tries to have, it tries to use glutathione in the brain to take the, brain out, take the mercury out of the brain and put it into the blood. But if you have high levels of mercury in the blood already and give them glutathione, it'll go back the other direction. Okay, so I'm not saying don't do it, but I'm saying before you give IV glutathione, get the mercury out of the blood first to decrease the risk of putting mercury into the brain. And okay, leave it at that. Okay, nebulized works great. Um, so you basically use it as, a, as an inhaler, and it's been used in COPD, Parkinson's disease, and several conditions of that nature. I had a sister-in-law uh, who had um, COPD, uh, was on oxygen from having smoked pretty much all her life. Uh, she came to us, you know, typical family members, eh, what you do is, you know, not important. You, you know, be a real doctor. Oh, I'm on oxygen now, and the quality of my life is really decreasing. Can you help me? Okay, so the answer was yes, we could help her, and I gave her an inhaler with NAC and glutathione, and uh, after a few months, we got off oxygen, and that lasted for about 10 years. And then, uh, so she stopped taking it because she didn't need it. Uh, 10 years later, started eating oxygen again. We put her on again, she didn't need it, but this time it only lasted for a few years. Now she's having to use oxygen, and um, my, inter, uh, in, you know, my inhaling glucine and NAC is not restoring her lung function anymore, but we gave her like about 20 years of improved quality of life. Well, she, she tried using the inhaled and it didn't, it didn't help, no. Okay, oral. Sorry folks, oral doesn't work. Um, now, there was one study published recently that showed that, uh, so, so here, here's the best study that's been done for a while, and that's Bastyr. At Bastyr, they had uh, 40 healthy volunteers, 500 milligrams twice a day of glutathione. They looked at total glutathione, reduced glutathione, oxidized glutathione. They looked at, a bunch of, they looked at oxidative stress, looked at a bunch of factors, no change between placebo and glutathione. Now, this group uh, showed that giving people 1,000 milligrams of glutathione after six months uh, got an elevation in blood uh, levels of glutathione. It was expensive cysteine as near as I can tell. Okay, so what happens with oral glutathione gets broken down in the gut into cysteine. That cysteine is absorbed. 
So at that point, yes, you are going to get some improvement in glutathione, but that's an incredibly expensive way of getting cysteine into the body. So I'm not a believer in oral glutathione. Sorry, bioceuticals and everybody else who's selling it. I don't think it's the optimal strategy. Okay, so it's, so I'm not, okay, anyway, just leave it at that. Okay, liposomal and transdermal um, don't have much in the way of publications, but what is there, and anecdotal reports uh, from a laboratory friend of mine who did an informal study says that the liposomal and topical do increase glutathione levels uh, according to blood measures. Intranasal, so I got quite intrigued with this idea, and my concern was that, well, a person has high levels of mercury in the blood, and we get their glutathione production increased, are we going to run the risk of increased glutathione in the blood, resulting in more mercury going to the brain? So I was intrigued by this idea of doing intranasal glutathione. I got intrigued by that idea because um, I was looking at drug research, and the drug researchers were binding drugs that wanted to put into the brain to glutathione, spraying people's noses, and getting increased levels of, of the drug in the brain. Of course, they only measured the drug in the brain, they didn't measure glutathione. But it seemed to me, since they're using glutathione as a transporter, they must have known it was going to get into the brain. Well, one of my, stu one of my graduates, uh, Lori Mis uh, Misley, uh, is getting her PhD in glutathione at the University of Washington. So, having been one of my trusty students, she said, well, I wonder if Dr. Pizzorno was right. So she goes into the lab, sprays 20 milligrams of glutathione into her nose, and got a 53% increase in glutathione in the brain. So I do know that it works. So I tried using this protocol with the oil field workers in Canada, and it was a total failure. They wouldn't do it. Okay, so that's the way it goes. Okay, so um, the protocol that we now use, and I think this is actually very useful for anybody whom you're concerned about mercury in the brain, if they're willing to do it, uh, you have it made up by a, a compounding pharmacist. It's typically 200 milligrams per ml, and you do a one or two sprays in the, each nostril a couple times a day. The problem with this is that it's fairly expensive, and they, it's only good for 30 days. So the, you get the glutathione spray, you put it in the refrigerator, and after 30 days, there's no reduced glutathione left over. Okay, increased production. <clears throat> By far, the most effective ways are with N acetylcysteine and whey powder. So five, by basically 1,000 milligrams of N acetylcysteine or 15 grams of, of um, uh, whey powder twice a day will increase RBC glutathione by about 30%. Now, there's gonna be variability according to individuals, but in general, you get about 30% increase. If you do have a patient who's really sensitive to sulfur compounds, you can give them methionine Methionine will also uh, increase their glutathione levels, but the problem is it will also increase their homocysteine. If you give them SAMe, you don't get the elevation of homocysteine, and you still get the elevation of glutathione. And what the mechanism is for that, I don't know, because it goes through the same pathway, but that's what the research says. Uh, the problem with SAMe, of course, is like five times as expensive for the same elevation in glutathione that you get with NAC. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So then you're, you, a question you might ask yourself, if you're like me, you're thinking, well, if you increase glutathione levels, do you therefore decrease GGT because more glutathione is available? And the answer is yes. So here's a study looked at giving people 600 milligrams a day for four weeks. They decreased their GGT from 62.7 to 46.3. So clearly there's a population that had chemical exposure, given the NAC, and you decrease the GGT. That could also be they help to decrease toxins as well. But over that shorter period of time, most likely it was increasing glutathione so the body did not need to produce, reduce, re, um, recycle the glutathione quite as much. Okay, so how about some other ways of uh, improving glutathione? How about beer? So this study was done with uh, nuns. They're in a cloister. They were soon to be alcohol-free. And they gave them this, uh, they gave them a 500, milligram, a 500 milliliters uh, twice a day, and um, they increased their RBC glutathione by 29%. So I think one reason why things like beer and wine um, seem to be beneficial in terms of longevity is that they improve glutathione levels independently of the alcohol that's in them. So that's kind of nice. And then uh, cruciferous vegetables also increase glutathione. Uh, meditation increases glutathione. Exercise, both strength training and anaerobic exercise, but anaerobic plus strength training together have the best impact on glutathione levels. Uh, glutathione produce, uh, uh, IV glutathione protects neurons. Here's study using, no, they didn't worry about the mercury. They gave people a large amount of IV glutathione as for people who had um, 
uh, Parkinson's disease, and they found a substantial improvement in Parkinson's disease symptomatology that lasted for uh, um, two to four months after they stopped the IV uh, glutathione. So clearly, glutathione is really helpful in many, many ways. Okay, and then finally, we have systemic detoxification, saunas, fasting, hydrotherapy, and spa program. So saunas, uh, some really nice research done. Again, uh, you see uh, Stephen Genuis did a bunch of this research. I don't know if I have him quoted here. But these are basically long-term, modest temperature saunas with lots of fluids and lots of electrolytes. You get increased secretion of arsenic, cadmium, lead, mercury, phthalates, PCBs, PBBs, and HCBs. In other words, it's a very effective way of getting these toxins out of the body. Now, the most effective saunas are when you're long enough so they go from, from the watery sweat to the oily sweat. And that oily sweat is really, really high in toxins. Okay. Here's a study done in hydrotherapy. This was cool. It was the Bath General Hospital in the UK looked at 120 years worth of data of treating chimney sweeps and find out the chimney sweeps got better with hydrotherapy. Some researchers reproduced the hydrotherapy that was being used, the protocol that was being used, and found that they increased urinary excretion of lead um, by 250% and it lasted for two and a half hours after they stopped the hydrotherapy. So something about full body immersion hydrotherapy that increases our excretion of lead. SPA program, here's a study that I published in my journal, and they basically put people on a one week um, calorie restricted uh, fast, it was called a juice fast, primarily uh, vegetable juices, got colonics four times a week, and then it then looked at toxicity, and the one that I found most interesting was look at the GTT, and it went from 23 down to 20. So I thought that was a pr pretty interesting indication of getting toxins out of the body. Okay, so summary intervention. Now we're getting to our, I got four case histories. Number one, find and eliminate the source of the toxins, eat organically grown foods, use uh, low POP health and beauty aids, facilitate detoxification, high fiber diet, diet, multivitamins and minerals, long saunas, protect from damage by promoting glutathione, and acetylcysteine, and DMSA if high levels of mercury or lead. It works. Okay, so intervention we use in Canada. So again, I got to use this protocol over a large number of people, and what happened? So here we have their challenge testing with mercury before and after, and we also got some to get rid of the Malcolms. We got a 40% reduction in their load of, of mercury in their bodies. So nice, effective, no adverse effects. Okay, ooh, they're not using, doggone it, they didn't use, Tech people, they didn't use my current one. Okay, pretend. I have one that was optimized for case presentation, and they they're, they didn't use that one, which I gave them. Okay, okay. So I was supposed to. Sh I was going to show you, show this to you step by step. You're going to see it all at once. Okay. So this is the guy who got me most enthused and most aware of how important this is. So this is a fellow, 48-year-old employee in Calgary. Um, he was healthy until he was a teenager. He got, had a bunch of cavities as a, teen, as a teenager, got a bunch of fillings into his mouth, and in those fillings, he then traced back to that time when he started developing all these, all these health problems. So, um, and at this point, before he got into intervention, after having all these fillings in his mouth for about 30 years, chest pain, multiple trips to emergency room, no reasons, all kinds of problems. It was only eight amalgams and only uh, two gold crowns. Okay, so it wasn't a lot of mercury. But what often happens is when gold crowns are put in, they're put in over the mercury fillings. So we have gold over the mercury fillings. You get an increased rate of mercury release from the fillings. So he, he only had 5.8 micrograms per gram of um, creatinine. So it wasn't, I've seen much higher levels of mercury, but that's what he had. So we removed all the amalgams with the ecological dentist, gave him B vitamins, gave him uh, vitamin C, infrared sauna, uh, IV DMPS. This is one of the people we gave the IV DMPS to, and remarkable. Within uh, a few months, he said that he felt better than he had in 15 years, and after a period of time, he <clears throat> not only had all his symptoms alleviated, but also he discontinued all his drugs. So basically, it took about two years to get all the mercury out of his body, but by the time we got all the mercury out of his body, this is the list of symptoms that went away. 
So this was such a dramatic case, I actually published it in my journal. So he had all these symptoms, and after two years, two years, again, slow, after two years, they were all gone. Okay, next one. So you've heard the term about um, uh, you can either have wealth or health. If, if you had a choice between wealth and health, which one are you going to choose? This is um, the wife of, or the, the spouse of a family that is one of the 50 richest in Canada. She came to me and she thought she was losing her mind. Now she was having all these symptoms, uh, brain fog, um, uh, loss of memory, uh, bad taste in her mouth, skin was bad, her hair was falling out. I mean, she, was just, she thought she was getting dementia. She had been seeing an MD, an integrative medicine MD, who by the way is a great doctor, just it wasn't successful for her, and it had two years of IV chelation therapy with DMPS and had to stop it because number one, her mercury was not going down, and number two, she was having so many adverse effects from the um, DMPS IV chelation therapy, she just had to stop doing it. So one people got brain fog afterwards. Okay, so her mercury levels was 50. So this is, this is her challenge mercury. After two years of chelation therapy, she had challenge mercury of 50. That is really high. It's a lot of mercury in her body. So I put her on, on my protocol. Yeah, the protocol was 250 milligrams oral DMPS, a, a DMSA every third night, 500 milligrams twice a day of NAC, and 2.25 milligrams uh, grams of uh, PGX three times a day, and here's what happened. She said, after six months, she said, I know that things really improved once I started your protocol, and I was happy to see the light at the end of the mercury tunnel. So after six months, we got her mercury down to 12. Still having symptoms, okay, but she was getting better. A year later, with each successive test, the symptoms were lessening, and I was feeling more normal. So after a year now, she's down to 7.3 year and a half later. It was a day of celebration when I received the test results because my worker was normal and her symptoms were all gone, okay? So she said I could use her data as long as I didn't tell you her name. And she said, and this is partic in particular important, she said, tell people it takes time to get the mercury out of the body. So it took her a year and a half, but now a year and a half later, all her problems are gone, okay? So very, very nice uh, example of getting the mercury out safely with no adverse side effects. Right, yeah, so not that she felt horrible for a year and a half, but she was feeling, every month she was feeling a bit better, a bit better, a bit better, until it was all gone. Okay, this is an obvious one. 40-year-old um, white male came to see me, um, multiple symptoms brought by his wife, primarily because of loss of sex drive and impotence. She wasn't happy about that. And he was also having fatigue. Uh, he was a wooden boat builder. So it turns out um, he was from a place called Port Townsend, which is about 30 miles from Seattle, but it's a two-hour ride because you have to go through a ferry to get to Seattle. But anyway, um, he, came, he came to see me, and a boat builder uh, very quickly determined high levels of solvents, high levels of arsenic and cadmium. Because so what I had him do is I had him bring to me what he was using with his wooden boat building and fiberglass. So I looked at what was in the cans and such, and all kinds of bad, bad, you know, you, there's, you can look up what is in these various things and all kinds of bad things. So anyway, I put him on a de detoxification program, which was number one is stop exposing yourself to all these chemicals, you know, air out the place, wear a mask, all these kinds of things. Um, I uh, gave him liver cholagogues. So I knew that the liver was the primary method for getting rid of these toxins. I gave him herbal cholagogues. I also gave him a lot of fiber. And after six months, we cleared out the toxins. He was having sex again, and he and his wife were, were really happy. Just a, a very straightforward uh, case. This one's a little more complex. So 60-year-old, relatively healthy um, uh, man, uh, but he was basically progressive loss of energy and brain function. He was seeing an integrated medicine MD who referred him over to me because wasn't getting the results being looked for. Also was seeing an acupuncturist. So um, he had, um, we, che we checked him out. I was told that he had a high level of mercury in the blood. Um, but I, had, I wasn't given the original uh, findings, but my thought was, okay, he has mercury in the blood, I'm more interested in what's in his body. So we did the challenge testing on him, you know, the 500 milligrams of oral DMSA and 300 milligrams of oral DMPS, and sure enough, uh, he had a fair amount of mercury. He had 21, which is a you know, good, good load of mercury. Now, he had no fillings. He was only eating low mercury fish, but nonetheless, I put him on my standard protocol I just told you about. 
After one year, he had no improvement. I think, well, what's going on here? This pro car, I've used it in a lot of people. It's worked great, no improvement. So I uh, did a blood test on him. This was just a year ago now. And it was interesting. His bilirubin was 1.6. His ALT was 51. And his mercury was still at 19. So it, his blood mercury had been 21 before, and now it's at 19. So it told me not only did he have a body load of mercury, he also had current exposure to chemicals and he may have been other things he was being exposed to. I was mainly, we were mainly looking at mercury at that point. So again, I told him, here's all the, here's the source of mercury. Make sure you've gotten rid of all of them. Well, you know, um, checked him again a few months later, and um, still elevated bilirubin. Uh, ALT is down to 30, which is marginal at this point. So it looks like maybe the chemical exposure is low. Blood mercury is still at 18. So this is telling me he has continuing exposure to chemicals and to mercury. So I told him at that point, stop taking your Chinese herbal medicine formula and don't eat any fish whatsoever. Mercury down to six, okay? So this is a few months later, mercury down to six. Build room down a bit, but the build room and ALT is still higher than I want, but the mercury is down. So it may have been fish, but I'm almost sure it was the Chinese medicine herbal formula they was using that actually had metals in it. And that's where he was getting his acute poison with metals. Okay. Now I had at, re recommended to him that he send um, his herbal preparation to a laboratory to have it tested for mercury. He was unwilling to do that, which was interesting. So in summary, um, our body load of exogenous chemicals is substantial. We, um, the good news, is that we can do something about it. We can decrease exposure, and when people have chemi chemical toxins, we can help get it out of the body more quickly. Uh, avoidance work, but exposure is not avoidable. Nutrients, botanicals, hydrotherapy, and specific drugs as necessary will decrease the body load of chemicals and metals in our body. So thank you for your kind attention. Let's have a discussion. I was wondering if you've noticed about that any um, adverse reactions to dermal glutathione. I've had a patient recently using glutathione cream and he came up with a, a, almost a urticaria type response where the cream was. Can you comment on that? Um, I'm not surprised because uh, when you think about these various creams and such, they're going to have carriers and it's not surprising a patient may react to a carrier. I don't think they're going to react to glutathione because it's not an, an antigenic uh, substance. Okay. So most likely it's a carrier. Yes. Pardon? Sorry, it could also be reduced if it's an old cream, like if it's got past it, ox oxidized. Sorry. Could be oxidized, right. Reduced, yeah. Possibly it's oxidized as well. Yes, ma'am. Do you want to comment on the use of selenium for encouraging glutathione reduction? Yes. So, um, <coughs> Uh, I've kind of left out some stuff, so let's back up on some things. So in, ad in addition to this protocol I described to you with the NAC, the uh, DMSA, and the fiber, I also designed a multivitamin and mineral to both promote glutathione production in the body and to replace trace minerals. And selenium is one of the key ones I made sure was in there because selenium is particularly good at protecting the body from the damaging effects of cadmium uh, as well as mercury. So trace minerals are critically important, and I recommend that everybody get a good quality multivitamin mineral that's particularly strong in the trace, in the trace minerals. Okay, so selenium is very, very, very important for that. Also, selenium is important, as you know, for many of the enzymes that utilize glutathione and recycle glutathione are also selenium dependent. Okay. What sort of dose of selenium? <coughs> so the, what dose of selenium to use? So as you know, selenium is one of our interesting minerals in that is that at high dosages, it can become toxic. Okay, so when I'm repleting my patients, I'm pretty, I'm pretty conservative. I typically only use about one milligram per day to replete them for several months, and I usually use then a maintenance dose of 250 to 500 micrograms per day. You're gonna have to kind of play that by ear. I think you're very unlikely to run into trouble with selenium below about 
maybe three to five milligrams per day. But if you do three to five milligrams per day, I think after a year or two, you do have a risk of some people having a toxic reaction to it. Oh yeah, so uh, one Brazil nut, one or two Brazil nuts, for example. How many of you watch House? Okay, do you remember the House episode of the guy who was eating all the Brazil nuts getting selenium poisoning? Okay, it was interesting. Okay. okay. Just, uh, just a quick question. Oh, yes. Uh, uh, what's your opinion about, what do you think about sublingual administration of glutathione through saliva? I think the sublingual use of various agents is intriguing, and I, do, and I think while some are absorbed, some are not, and I don't know the answer with glutathione if it's actually absorbed or not. Are you aware of any s data looking at RBC glutathione after sublingual ad administration? I'm not seeing any data on that. Have you seen any data on that? No, I haven't. Okay, so it may work, I simply don't know. Can I ask about homocysteine levels? I've got yeah. a patient with a slightly raised one. I don't know what, what would you call raised? Is there some Ah, difference? very good question. So we will talk about that tomorrow, but I'm happy mm -hmm. to talk about it today. It's fascinating looking at the medical research on what's considered abnormal homocysteine. Because remember, 14 used to be considered abnormal. Then it went to 12, and now it looks like it's about 10. So I actually wrote an editorial on homocysteine because I was curious, well, high levels are toxic, but homocysteine is right in the middle of a lot of metabolism. Are low levels a problem? The answer is yes. So if you have homocysteine below four, you actually get increased disease incidence. And homocysteine above eight uh, has disease correlations with atherosclerosis and dementia. So somewhere between four and eight, I don't know, but that's what it looks like is the optimal level for homocysteine. Now I have had some people recommend it should be below 4.5. I do not think that's accurate. I, I won't say anybody's names, but there is a integrated medicine at, uh, MD out there recommended be down into around 4.5. I don't think that's correct. I think that you start run to problems with non enough homocysteine be available to provide cysteine when we need it and to transport uh, methyl groups. And so would you do anything different to increase their glutathione if you're elevated? So the elevated homocysteine, uh, interestingly enough, if you put a person on a Mediterranean type diet, the homocysteine goes down. So the worse the person's diet, the higher their homocysteine. Now having said that, yes, we want to use methyl donors and for those who don't respond to methyl donors, uh, then you want to, and also you want to use an activated, activated folate. So in that situation, you also may want to consider betaine as well. Because as you may recall, again, I'll show you this tomorrow, there are two ways in which we recycle homocysteine. One's through betaine and the other's through methyl, methyl groups. There's a question over here. Hi. Uh, yeah. Is there any effective um, detoxification method for aluminum toxicity? For what? Aluminum and contamination? Aluminum. Uh, al aluminum, sorry. Oh, aluminum. Oh, yeah. thank you. <laughs> um, extremely good question. Um, I have looked for it and have not been able to find any research that documented eliminated aluminum. Now, I, 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 seriously, I have looked because I was very curious about that. Has anybody here seen any research that shows elimination of aluminum with any kind of protocol? Somebody have, can answer that for us? Uh, oh, back there, can you answer that question? Oh, you're not answering the question. No, no, no. And does anybody, has anybody seen a protocol for getting rid of aluminum? Because, I mean, seriously, I have looked. I couldn't find anything in PubMed. Yes. Um, sorry if I'm repeating this question. I'm over here. Hello. Um, if, as naturopaths in this country, do you feel we have enough in our artillery um, whether it's oral, NAC, selenium, all of those sorts of things to help our patients detoxify enough or do we need to have access, work with a doctor? Are we being fair to our right. patients or right. do we have enough? Extremely good question. My belief if is, is if you have somebody who's symptomatic and, for example, look at that patient I showed you, that 67-year-old woman, someone who is quite symptomatic and who has high mercury levels, well, we could have gotten the same thing simply with the fiber and the NAC. The DMSA clearly accelerated the process. I would for sure use DMSA for someone like that. Now, if they're not as bad, then you can take longer. But it's pretty symptomatic, you need to do that. Now, something that I rushed over earlier today that I would like to comment on further, and that is using drugs to get chemicals out of the body. 
So for example, people with high levels of POPs, uh, research has now shown that if you give them cholestyramine or, cl or clostamide, uh, you actually will get the POPs out of the body more quickly. So in general, I don't like using those drugs because they're kind of indiscriminate. So not only do they get rid of cholesterol, they get rid of fat-soluble vitamins as well, but they also get rid of the, fat of, the, uh, of the persistent organic pollutants. So there's research showing that they are actually effective. You can also, if you want to, you can use um, with your patients uh, potato chips and things like that that are made with um, olestra. So this olestra, which is a, um, a fat binder that's been used as a weight loss program, well, it turns out that the olestra will also help get pops out of the body. Now, I don't generally recommend processed foods that have added chemicals to them, but if you have high levels of pops, it's a relatively safe way of getting chemicals out of the body. Okay. So, you know, again, I'm, I'm very much into integrated medicine, and uh, whatever my patient needs is what I'm going to use with that patient. Just back onto the homocysteine. Here I am. Yes. Homocysteine. So I have a really low homocysteine of 3.5. Ah. But I also have the MTHFR gene with the homozygous C. So it's the double. Um, so when I take methylated Bs, I actually feel really sick. But I've been advised to take them, obviously, because of the gene. But I have really low homocysteine. So do you think it's a wise thing for me to take the B vitamin? So first off, your body needs B vitamins for more things than just homocysteine. <clears throat> so yes, you do need B vitamins. But I would say you're probably a person who needs more cysteine on a regular basis because your storage source of cysteine is not there. Is so that would, why you think the homocysteine is so low? Um, I don't think we understand at this point. I, I only found a couple studies that looked at people with low homocysteine. And at those studies, they hadn't figured out why it was happening, but they were seeing disease correlations. So. Um, you're probably right, it's probably something that's genetic that's doing it, um, I, but I don't know anything more than that. If you, uh, uh, tomorrow, in my lecture on homocysteine, I refer to the key article I found on low homocysteine, you may want to read that article and see if it points you in some directions that might be useful. And do you recommend methylated um, folate and B12 as, as a practitioner? So n normally I don't recommend them unless they're needed. Um, because they're more expensive. Now, having said that, when I designed my multivitamin, I put in methylated uh, B12 because it wasn't that much more expensive, and I was able to, uh, you're able to capture some people who are going to need it. Same reason why I put in pyridoxal 5-phosphate. So only 20% of the population doesn't convert B6 to pyridoxal 5-phosphate very well, but enough people don't, I put it in there. Same thing with vitamin A, as, um, as uh, Michael mentioned earlier. Remember, about 30% of Caucasians don't convert beta carotene into vitamin A very well. So I think this whole thing about being afraid of vitamin A has been a real big mistake. So I think vitamin A is really necessary. Not, I think beta carotene is useful, but beta carotene does not replace vitamin A. Yes? Do you have any experience in using broken cell wall chlorella as a detoxifier? <sighs> yeah. So um, uh, I, try not to, I, I try to only look at things that are positive. Um, chlorella and um, uh, what's it, the, um, uh, the, the modified citrus, cit uh, citrus pectin, they're all popular ways of decreasing toxins. But I want to tell you, there's no research in PubMed that supports them whatsoever. Okay, and I'm not saying they don't work. I'm saying there's no PubMed research. Now, having said that, uh, one of my graduates, uh, Walter Crinion, whom you may know, He's become quite expert in toxicity and detoxification. He has tried controlled studies, un, uh, um, informal control studies with his patients, giving them those agents, and they did not decrease their toxic load. Okay? So I think chlorella is a good, healthy food, but if you're expecting it to decrease metals and chemicals, there's no research support for it. Okay. Okay. Yes. I'm concerned about a high fiber diet. Depends on the type of fiber. And a high fiber diet or the wrong type of fiber can create deficiencies in zinc, minerals, essential fats. Uh, I'm a per person who really advocates a high fiber from vegetables, but not from grains. Okay. Uh, I consider grains to be deadly. And it is not any uh, of my sort of uh, recommendations to my patients to do with grains. 
Okay. So can you let us know a little bit more what the fiber you use for detoxification? Uh, uh, thank you, very, very good uh, question. So I recommend fiber to my patients. I do not recommend wheat bran, okay? And you'll hear my lecture tomorrow, I'll be talking about wheat. I, don't, I think wheat bran is a very bad choice. I do recommend oat bran, um, and I, by my favorites are vegetables and flax seeds and nuts and beans and lentils and things of this nature. I prefer more of the foods uh, rather, rather than the grains as a way of increasing fiber in people's bodies. Now there is research looking at, unfortunately the research on fiber is primarily with wheat fiber, okay? And wheat fiber does indeed decrease POP levels, but people have, so many people have trouble with wheat, with wheat I don't recommend the, the, the wheat, uh, wheat fiber as a, as a good strategy. Okay, but thank you, that's a good, good point to bring up. The other questions people have or recommendations, yes? Uh, is the challenge test oral DMSA and oral DMPS or yes. is it IV? Oral. All, all, They're all both oral. oral. All, all, yes. Right. For the naturopaths who can't use the DMSA, is a 24 hour urine worthwhile otherwise? Is there any conversion between a challenge and a, a stock standard 24 hour collection? Um. I'm not aware of any natural agent that will get enough excre increased excretion of these heavy metals to be worth the difference between the acute and the challenge testing. It may be something I'm, I'm simply not aware of it. Now there is a laboratory you have here called Nutripath, and they, they show me their uh, list of tests. And this is interesting that they do have a number of tests that show you when people are being damaged by toxins. So they're not actually measuring the toxins, they're measuring damage from toxins. Actually, I think that's pretty useful. I'm, I've not been quite read, ready to recommend them because I've been mostly focused on determining what the level of toxins are in the body more directly rather than indirect tests uh, using organic urinary acids and porphyrins. So how many of you have my textbook of natural medicine? Oh, great, okay, so you know we have in their chapters on urinary organic acids and porphyrins. And so if you want to delve into that way of determining toxic load, I uh, actually have a fair amount of content for you to look at there. Yes? Uh, have you used MSN for heavy metal detox? That's a good question. There are people who use MSN in conjunction with these other agents. All I can say is uh, it did not show up in PubMed as being a tested method. So it may work, it may not, I simply don't know. Again, I really try to look at where does research show us what works. So you may notice uh, from my commentary and the research I've been quoting, I did not come out of the chelation, um, the, the metal chelation school of, of integrated medicine from the US. I came at it totally independently by looking at the research and doing it in corporate wellness programs. So I'm not gonna say, so I'm, I'm not saying what they're doing is right or wrong. I went at this completely from the perspective of what has actually been researched and published in the preview scientific literature. Question, uh, question here next. Um, I'm just wondering if your client's natural ability to produce glutathione was affected once you took them off N acetylcysteine. So the, the assumption is that um, our wonderful bodies upregulate DGT as necessary uh, for the production of glutathione. So clearly if you do decrease the, N the uh, cysteine availability and they still have toxic load, one would expect that their, um, that their DGT is going to go up the body tries to produce more glutathione. And also Mark was mentioning, Mark, where are you? Yeah, Mark, why don't you mention your comment about patients uh, going off alcohol and still having IGPT. I think that was important information. Okay. Oh, okay. The point was that most of the people intoxicated lost their alcohol tolerance. So by the time I see them, they, they were intolerant of alcohol their GGTs were still raised and doctors just assumed that they were still drinking alcohol and didn't ask them because the dirty secret is you see GGT, assume an alcoholic right, that's right. just lying to you. Right. But when they detoxified, the GGT came down right. and they still couldn't take their alcohol. Sorry. Yes. Yeah, sorry, just alpha lipoic acid doses. Would you just, on a daily basis, just 500 milligrams? It, so it depends upon what you're trying to accomplish. <coughs> So if you're using it as, um, uh, as a healthy antioxidant, 250 milligrams is fine. But if you're, if you're like me, I'm, I'm a very avid basketball player. 
I play two hours of full court basketball two to three times a week with guys half my age. That means I'm getting my mitochondria a real run for the money. So I take um, uh, about 500 milligrams of alpha lipoic acid as part of my protocol to protect my mitochondria from the increased oxidative damage. Now, if you have somebody with diabetes and you're trying to deal with the sequelae, you know, the peripheral neuropathy, the nephropathy, and, et cetera, uh, then they'll be using higher doses of alpha lipoic acid and the 500 maybe as much as a gram uh, per day dose. But the good news is that they actually get clinical improvement at those high dosages. Now, if you are interested in the mitochondrial si side of it, you want to combine it with acetyl L-carnitine because it's much more effective for increasing mitochondrial ATP production. We have two more questions and then we're off to a break. Okay. Yes. I just wanted to ask if you had an opinion about the APOE genotype and um, the 3-4 and 4-4, four, four, whether right. you change your protocol? No, I, actually I wouldn't. So actually, I think you all know the APOE4 um, uh, allele is very predictive of dementia. So people are homozygous for APOE4, uh, they get dementia like 20 years earlier and it accounts for about 20% of dementia. So these are people who are particularly sensitive, you might say, to oxidative stress. Interestingly enough, the APOE4, it persists in our genome because it helps protect the brain from infection, which is interesting. So for those people, rather than looking at it as a, you might say, a prescription for Alzheimer's disease, what I say to them instead is you have to be particularly careful about your oxidative stress. So for example, if you go on a, on a, a healthy Mediterranean diet, you can decrease your risk of Alzheimer's disease equivalent to uh, what your increased risk was for the APOE4. Now, do you have some reasons? Would you have a recommendation for changing a protocol based on homozygous APOE4? Uh, it seems that many patients don't tolerate chelation well at all. Oh, that's why we're going with that. If they're a 4-4, four, yeah. four, right. and often you have to go a lot slower with them. Right. So, that, so that's, again, another reason why I like the protocol I have. So yes, it takes a year or two, but you don't get after adverse effects with people. And so that's, it worked a lot better. Last, one. Last question, okay. Um, ha have you seen the use of coriander in uh, mercury detoxification or cilantro? Uh, cilantro, no research on it. I have not looked for coriander. But unfortunately, cilantro is another one. Commonly considered, I looked and there's no published research on it. Great. We're off for a break.